Well, you can join me in opening your Bibles to First Peter. We're continuing our series in uh, First Peter, and if you don't have a Bible, you can find one under chairs nearby, and our text this morning is on page 1014 in those Bibles. Uh, let's pray together. Father, we thank You for Your Word, and we pray now that as we hear it, it wouldn't be a merely intellectual exercise, but our minds would be fully engaged, but also our hearts and affections would be deeply affected and changed, and it would lead to a changed life as well. Uh, so give us the hope and faith and love that are found in Jesus from our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. So First Peter chapter 1, we are in verses 10 through 12. Let's read it together as we begin. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when He predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. Well, this letter is about how Christians have a new identity and a new way of living in the world. So if you are a Christian, according to 1 Peter, you are an exile. Soon enough, you'll find yourself out of place in this culture or any culture. You'll be part of a misunderstood minority The first century Christians Peter's writing to were experiencing various forms of soft persecution. They were being slandered and mistreated and rejected. Many Christians in the West today are beginning to experience this as well. Our post-Christian and secular society is increasingly like the world of the first century Christians. And that means letters like 1 Peter to those kinds of Christians will feel increasingly relevant to us. So what do we need in this kind of environment that we live in? We need hope, and we need encouragement. So our text today gives hope in a hostile world by reminding us of the wonder of Jesus and the gospel. You know, one strange problem of the Christian life is that you and I can get bored with Jesus. We start off the Christian life perhaps marveling at Him. We have a profound sense of privilege that God would choose us. But then we tend to move past this, and we can view the gospel as the kindergarten of the Christian life, and then we want to be moving beyond the gospel. We become familiar with the Bible, and then it becomes boring to us. So Peter is reminding us of the endless wonder of Jesus and really the whole Bible as a message about Jesus. It reminds us that we're part of an incredible story, and Jesus is endlessly fascinating. The more that we marvel at Jesus' grace in the whole Bible, the more that we will actually have the hope we need to live in a hostile world. So here's the point of the text this morning. The gospel of Jesus in all of Scripture is an endless marvel. So here's what this means. It means that no matter what suffering you face, No matter how misunderstood or marginalized you feel among friends or family members or coworkers or cultural elites, no matter how much people think that you are on the wrong side of history, you can know that you are at the center of God's plan for the whole world and human history. The whole Bible shows that all of history is about Jesus and His grace to His people. So this morning, I want to convince you of that. The gospel of Jesus and all the scriptures is an endless marvel. And I want to convince you of this, not just so you know it's true. Many of you already believe that it's true at some level. But my hope is that the Lord would replace any amount of boredom that we have with this with wonder so that we can have the kind of hope and joy we need through suffering. So the plan this morning is simply to unfold the three parts of that sentence. The gospel of Jesus in all of Scripture, is an endless marvel. So, the first part of the sentence, the gospel of Jesus. 
This is the main theme and topic of this text. Peter uses a number of different words and phrases to refer to it. I want to show you three aspects of this big idea of the gospel of Jesus here. So there's three aspects at the very heart of Christianity. The first is this, that the gospel is about salvation. So Peter begins in verse 10 by saying, concerning this salvation. So he's been talking about this. It's the main topic so far in the letter. Verses 3 to 12, if you just look at that on your by in your Bibles, it's actually one long sentence in Greek, and it has one main topic. Peter is praising God the Father for his salvation through Jesus. The word salvation has become so common to many of us that it can lose its, rich, its richness. It's not a simple or thin idea here, though. Notice how he talks about salvation here. So in verse 3, he refers to salvation as including being born again and having a living hope. So he says, blessed be God the Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. So God causes us to be born again. Uh, This is the new birth. It's what theologians call regeneration. It's a complete renewal from the inside out. He gives us a new heart to trust Christ. We're born again then to a living hope. So we're not just saved through the new birth, but we're given a living hope for our eternal future. Then in verse 4, you can see he says that this living hope is an inheritance that's kept in heaven for us. So the inheritance is referring to the fullness of what God gives us with Jesus upon Jesus' return. It's a way of referring to the whole new creation, a whole new world. Verse 5, he refers to the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 9, he refers to the salvation of your souls. So this is a future-oriented salvation. So we often use the word salvation to refer to the past in a Christian's life, right? I've been saved. God saved me. And that's fine. But salvation is a bigger idea than this. It's past, present, and future. God saved us. He is saving us. He will save us. Our salvation is not complete until Jesus returns and the new creation comes. And so in verse 10, Peter says, concerning this salvation. So this is what he's talking about. The gospel is about the fullness of our salvation, past, present, future that we're caught up into. Second, this gospel is about grace. Notice in verse 10, he also says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours. So salvation is about grace that comes to us. It's not a salvation that's a repayment for anything you do. Christianity is not a message of try harder, do better, run faster. Instead, it's an invitation to rest. It's an invitation to receive grace for even your deepest sins and your darkest moments. Our salvation is not something that we can accomplish in our own strength. It's a gift to receive. This is why Peter calls this message good news in verse 12. The message is good news, which is often contrasted rightly so with good advice, right? Good advice says, here's what you can do, and then you'll be rewarded with this. Here's what's required to get this result. The gospel says your salvation is already available. It's a gift to receive. It's free to you. And then third, the gospel is about Jesus. Verse 11 Peter refers to the sufferings of Christ and subsequent glories. So these are the sufferings of Jesus, especially on the cross for our sins, and then the subsequent glories of his resurrection from the dead, his ascension to heaven, his present reign, and his return to reign over a renewed creation forever. So these are the three essential elements of the gospel at the heart of the Christian faith. It's a message of salvation by grace through Jesus. And this is the endlessly fascinating reality that Peter wants us to marvel at. We have an incredible privilege as Christians to receive and enjoy this gospel. And this gospel is for both non-Christians and Christians. So it's for those who are not yet Christians because if that's you, this is what you are invited to receive. You're invited to bring all of your sins, all your mess, all your darkness to Jesus. And you can do this today. I encourage you right now or maybe later, just go home and pour your heart out to the God who made you. Open up totally before Him. Bring all of your sin and darkness to Him and ask Him to forgive you 
to draw near to you, to show you that he's real, and to accept you by grace. And this is also for Christians because we never move beyond this gospel, only deeper into it. And that's what Peter's going to show us next. So the gospel is at the very center of history. It's the main theme of the whole Bible. All the prophets before Jesus were looking forward to this and the dawning of salvation. So let's move to the second part of the sentence. The gospel of Jesus in all of Scripture. So Peter's point here is not to explain the gospel. It's to show how this is the central theme of the Bible. Look with me at verses 10 and 11 again. He says, concerning this salvation... The prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. So Peter is saying that the prophets of the Old Testament were writing about this salvation. Who were the prophets? Well, this would be a way of referring perhaps to most of the Old Testament. Moses, who wrote the first five books of the Bible, was a prophet. What we call the historical books, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and so forth, those were viewed as prophetic books by the Jews. And then, of course, this includes books that we refer to as the prophets, like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and so forth. And Peter saying, is saying that these prophets were prophesying about the grace and salvation of Jesus. They were predicting the sufferings and glories of Jesus. And notice how we can see that this really is the central message of the whole Bible. Notice two words that Peter uses to describe how the Bible speaks of the gospel. He says in verse 11, do you notice the word he uses? The prophets predicted salvation in Jesus. And then look at the word he uses in verse 12. He says that others now have announced this good news. So, if you're one who marks in your Bible, or if you have one of those scripture journals, you can underline predicted and announced. That's a summary of the Bible. The Old Testament predicted the gospel, the New Testament announces it. There's no sharp division or giant chasm between the message of the Old and New Testaments. It's a singular message about the salvation by grace through Jesus' sufferings and glories. Now, not everyone sees it this way. But Peter says this gospel of salvation by grace through Jesus is not just a New Testament message. This is what the Old Testament was anticipating. So let's think about how this should shape our view of the Old Testament. It's like most of the book you're holding. How should we view that part of the Bible? Well, think about what we've just seen about the gospel. First of all, this shows us that the prophets back then spoke about grace. That's not the word that comes to many people's minds when they think of the prophets in the Old Testament or the message of the Old Testament. What's the word that comes to most people's minds? Judgment. And Peter is saying they were also speaking about the grace that God would show the world. Second, the prophets spoke about Jesus. Many Jewish people missed this, of course. When Jesus came, they weren't expecting him to suffer and then enter glory. So after it happened, Jesus gave a lesson to a couple of his disciples. We see this in Luke 24. So here's what Jesus said to a few of his disciples. He said, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So he's like, did you not read the Old Testament? You were slow to believe what was there. He goes on to say, was it not necessary that the Christ, the Messiah, should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then later he said to more of his disciples, again, this is after his resurrection, he said, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written. So what is written? He's going to say, here's what the Old Testament spoke about that you should have known. And if you have a mind open to see this, here's what the Old Testament says. It says that the Christ, the Messiah, should suffer. Second, that on the third day he should rise from the dead. Third, that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. And then finally, that that begins from Jerusalem. He's saying all of that is there. That's the Old Testament message. 
So according to Jesus, the Old Testament predicted his sufferings, predicted his resurrection on the third day, predicted the proclamation of forgiveness of sins to all nations, and the fact that this would begin in Jerusalem. It's all there, he says, the prophet said it all. Jesus said to the Jewish leaders in John 5, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And then he said, it is they, the Old Testament scriptures, that bear witness about me. He says, if you believed Moses, you would believe me because he wrote of me. So the message of the Old Testament is about grace through Jesus. And then third, the prophets were speaking about a message not just for Israel, but for you. Peter says this two times. Notice in verse 10, he says, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, writing to Christians post Jesus' resurrection. And it was revealed to them, in verse 12 it says, that they were not serving themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you. So they were writing about the grace that was to be yours. They were writing not for their own generation, but for those who would come after Jesus. So like we saw last week, if you were here with us, this is the kind of text that can give us a new category if we don't have it. Maybe your categories are something like this. The Old Testament is mainly about judgment, mainly about Israel, and mainly about back then and there, those generations. Peter is saying the prophets were writing about grace, were writing about Jesus, and were writing for you and New Testament Christians. Maybe you think of the Old Testament like an Amazon package. The box carries the order of Jesus, and the moment you get it, you rip it open and throw away the box or recycle the box, and then you have Jesus now, and you can forget all about the Old. No, the Old Testament is a treasure chest that contains the treasures of Jesus and His grace for us. So the prophets were like chefs who make a meal for someone else to eat. They're taking the order, they're preparing it for us to enjoy later. I worked in catering for a while in college, so I was part of preparing the tables, uh, serving the food, serving the wine. I was setting the whole thing up for other people to enjoy. And, you know, sometimes it felt like an incredible privilege to even be part of these amazing banquets, lavish banquets, crazy expensive banquets, but how much more privileged were those who got to sit at the table and enjoy the meal? The prophets were setting the table, they were preparing the meal, and they were serving you. So when you see this, you look at the Bible differently. The Old Testament, as some have said, it's like a dimly lit room, and then when Jesus' death and resurrection come, then the light comes on. It doesn't get filled in with new furniture. The light comes on so we can see what's actually there more clearly. Genesis gives us the master promise of the Bible that a descendant of Eve will crush the head of Satan and bring blessing to all nations. Exodus gives us the picture of how God redeems his people from slavery. Jesus comes to bring the greater Exodus deliverance by setting us free from sin and Satan and death. Leviticus shows us how God comes to dwell with his people through a high priest who offers a sacrifice to bring God's people to God's presence. Jesus came as the true high priest to bring the final sacrifice of himself to restore us to God. Numbers shows us how God leads his sinful people through the wilderness to the promised land as Jesus now leads us through the wilderness of our suffering to the greater land of the new creation that's coming. Deuteronomy shows us how Israel will break God's covenant and he'll give a new one. Jesus came to bring that new covenant. Joshua shows us a leader who brings God's people into this new Eden-like land as Jesus is the greater Joshua who's bringing us into the new creation to come. Judges shows how God's people spiraled downward morally, spiritually, socially because they didn't have a king. Jesus came to bring the true king who causes his people to be restored at every level. Ruth shows us how God loves and redeems his people 
through Boaz-like love and redemption, and how he'll do this by sending Jesus through the line of Boaz and Ruth. Samuel shows us how God will send the world David's greater son who will reign forever. First and second kings show us how king after king failed and failed and failed, and that cultivates hope for the coming of Jesus, the one true king who won't fail. Isaiah promises Jesus will come as the servant who lived the faithful life Israel and humanity failed to live, will die for our sins, will rise again, and will restore us in a new creation forever. Jeremiah promises the new covenant will come through Jesus, which will provide forgiveness for sins, new hearts to obey God, and so on and so forth. Jesus is the seed of the woman, the greater prophet, priest, and king, the true temple, the final sacrifice, the second Adam, the true Israel, as Paul put it, All the promises of God are yes in Jesus. And so we end the Old Testament longing for, as Peter put it, the Christ who will suffer and enter into his glories and give us grace. The Old Testament predicted it. The New Testament announced it. And Jesus is at the center of the whole thing. The whole Bible is about salvation by grace through Jesus. Now, why does this matter for us? Last part of the sentence. The gospel of Jesus in all the scriptures is an endless marvel. Peter is saying this to show Christians like you and me that we have an incredibly privileged position. You don't feel like you're special in the world. You may feel marginalized. You may feel maligned. You may be overlooked. You're on the outside. You're told you're on the wrong side of history. Peter's saying, well, think about this. The gospel you received, the salvation you enjoy, is an endless marvel. It's an ocean without bottom. He says the prophets didn't just predict this stuff. He says they were searching it out and inquiring diligently about this stuff. And it's not just the prophets. The angels marvel at it. Did you catch that last line we considered at the beginning? Things into which angels long to look. The angels are leaning in at the edge of their seats, looking into and marveling at all of this. Now, the Bible doesn't say a lot about angels, but we do know that they're smart. We do know they've been around a lot longer than us. We do know that they're not bored about the gospel of Jesus and our salvation. Now, what's strange is that many Christians marvel about angels, but not the gospel. We get bored with the gospel, and we get fascinated with peripheral things. Angels are cool. Don't get me wrong. But if you started really looking into studying angels, do you know what you'd find? If you were to meet some of them, and interview them, and ask questions because you're fascinated about them, what would they say to you? They might say something like, I'm glad you're fascinated with me. Um, Do you know what you should be marveling at? (laughs) Jesus. That's what we marvel at. As the Apostle Paul referred to Jesus, he said, he referred to the unsearchable riches of Christ. Jesus is a treasure of unsearchable riches riches. He is less like a little drawing, a little sketch of the sun, moon, and stars, and more like what we see looking through the James Webb Space Telescope. The more we look at the sky, the further out we look, the more clear the vision, the more incredible it is. That's what Jesus is like. The angels long long to look into the salvation of Jesus in all the Bible. How much more should we, since they aren't even saved by it? We are. So how do we do this? How can we cultivate a wonder at Jesus and his gracious salvation in Scripture? Well, let's wrap up with a few ideas. First, realize that the question is not whether you marvel, but at what you marvel. What do you get excited about? What do you love learning about? What topic is most searched for in Google? Or, or what books are most taking up the most space on your shelves at home? Or what do you think about most? Is it sports games and highlights? 
investments, a certain historical period, grandkids, all that's fine to study and care about and marvel at and wonder at and spend your time thinking about, but the angels are showing that there's something better to make our primary ambition. So this is an invitation to rediscover Jesus. Maybe you are kind of like a Christian and you feel like you're a sheep that's just wandering. You're here on some Sundays, but maybe only half or less of your heart's into it. So this text is asking you, are you aware of what you're wandering away from? Is there something better, deeper, more long-lasting than Jesus in his grace? Or maybe you're just weary of life. Many of the Christians Peter wrote to felt like that, and so this is an invitation to get reinvigorated by getting to know the real Jesus. Maybe you're a student in high school, and you may still just be getting to know the real Jesus. I encourage you to use this season of life to get to know Jesus as well as you can. Very often, people who grow up in the church hit college, and then they realize they don't really know what the Bible's saying, even though they're kind of familiar with some of the parts, or they don't really know the real Jesus experientially. They've heard it all, but they haven't internalized it, and then they typically go in one of two directions. They either dig in and start marveling at Jesus and all the Scripture, or they move away from Him. So right now, you can go deep with Jesus and prepare for future seasons to go deeper with Jesus. Second thing we can do is ask God to open our eyes to see more, Jesus more clearly. The Apostle Paul refers to the eyes of our heart being opened. They need to be opened to see Jesus more clearly, to have a perception of the soul of who Jesus is. We need to have a mind and heart that's open to Him, that wants to know Him. And this is a prayer that God loves to answer. And the Holy Spirit loves to help with. One of the Spirit's main roles is to shine a spotlight on Jesus and cause our hearts to look to Him and marvel at Him. The Spirit doesn't direct our attention to Him so much as to Jesus and the radiance of God's glory in Him. So ask the Spirit to help you marvel like the angels. Third, learn to see how the Bible is all about Jesus. Learn what Peter means when he said the prophets predicted the sufferings and glories of Jesus. Learn what Jesus meant when he said that Moses spoke of him. Learn what Jesus meant when he said the scriptures were speaking of him and eternal life through him. So read through the Bible from beginning to end as a story about Jesus. Every time you read the Bible, ask the question, how does this text relate to Jesus and the gospel? Now, there's a danger in doing this because you can start making stuff up and saying, well, the chair there in this story was made of wood and the cross was made of wood. And so this story reminds me of Jesus and how they sat in the chair. We rest on Jesus. I've heard that one before. It's crazy. Don't do that. So sometimes you need help figuring out, okay, how does the Bible point to Jesus, the whole thing there? And so if you need help with this, find a friend who does know how to see Jesus in all of Scripture and meet with them and study the Bible together, do a reading plan with them, do a Bible reading plan with a friend or your spouse or a sibling and talk about what you're reading and ask the question, how do you think this relates to Jesus? And don't, maybe don't rush to an answer because you might be making something up. Maybe you say, I don't know, and then you can figure that out. Read books to get help with this. The category of reading that helps with this is called biblical theology. So that's not referring to just theology that's biblical. It's actually a kind of a technical term referring to the field of study that recognizes the whole Bible is a unity, the whole Bible is a big story, the whole Bible is about Jesus and his salvation through grace. And so if you want to see how Jesus is the center of the Bible, I put a bunch of books on the Resource Center. Um, I've read all the ones out there, so I commend all of them to you, Um, and those are selected to help you with this very thing. So grab a book there, grab a friend, read it together, meet to talk about it. Um, You know, there has been hardly a thing that has been more helpful to me in marveling at Jesus than learning from those books and conversations with people that speak about what those books are talking about than what helps me see Jesus in all the Bible. There's been hardly anything that's been more helpful than seeing the unity of the Bible because then you see the glories of Jesus in every text of the Bible. 
and you can marvel at him as you read anything in the Bible. Fourth, just get to know Jesus. Don't lose sight of him. As you study the Old Testament and read the Gospels and read the New Testament letters, study the character of Jesus, the work of Jesus, the heart of Jesus. Fifth, come on Sundays with the purpose of looking into Jesus and the gospel. One of the main purposes of this gathering is to help us be like the angels, to long to look into Jesus and the gospel together. So, a couple encouragements. Um, Maybe read the text before you come. The text that we're going to look at every Sunday is in the midweek. Um, You can see it coming because it's usually just the next one after whatever one we're in on Sunday as well. Um, Read it ahead and pray that God would help all of us to see Jesus in all of this. Um, Come early so that you can not only befriend people and get to know them, but be in this room on time. And that's not just to like, hey, we like to start on time and wish everyone's in here. It's for your own soul. I have found that if I am late to this room, it takes a while for me to get aligned and adjusted to what in the world's going on. So let's not waste this single gathering we have with so much grace once a week. Let's come ready, let's be sitting and eager, and let's lean in from the first moment to sing and to pray and to hear of the glories of Jesus and to have our souls realigned to him. And then during the service, uh, this is not kind of just... Um, wrote things that we do. In all our prayers, lean in with your mind and heart. In the scripture readings, lean in to see the glories of Jesus. In the sermon, pray that the Lord would be opening our minds and heart to see Jesus more clearly here so that we'd marvel at him. And then after the service, use whatever we've done here as a focus of conversation with one another, either right after the service or maybe later today or sometime during the week. And and about the sermon in particular, um, the great preacher of the last century, Martin Lloyd-Jones, said something interesting. He was a great expositional preacher, a great doctrinal preacher. Uh, He 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 had a breadth of topics that he would talk about, depth of his teaching and preaching. And do you know what he said is really going on here during his sermons? He said this, There is nothing new to say in a pulpit every Sunday. It is always the gospel. So he said when someone comes up after him and says sometimes in a sermon or after a sermon something like, ah, it's so simple, the gospel, great message today, as if it's kind of like a unique thing, he thinks, well, what did you expect? (laughs) It's what I'm always talking about. Finally, Let's spread the joy of marveling at Jesus to others. For their sake and for yours, one way that helps you keep marveling at Jesus even is by talking about him with others. And seeing them marvel at Jesus helps you marvel as well. And of course, we want to do this for their sake and for Christ's sake because he's worthy of marveling And other people need that. So in the end, we don't want to keep it to ourselves anyways. This is at the heart of why we want to be committed to personal evangelism. Not just living a good life in front of people, but looking for opportunities to talk about the glories of Jesus. It's why we want to just give Bibles away to people so they can see for themselves the real Jesus in Scripture. And it's why we're committed to global missions Because we believe that people are marveling too little. And there are places on the earth and people groups around the globe who do not yet marvel at Jesus. And so Jesus spreads us and sends us to bring people to marvel at what an infinitely wondrous person he is. Instead of marveling at money and wealth or things or power or success and so forth. Nothing there lasts. Nothing fulfills. So we want to be like the people in verse 12, those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit. So by the Spirit, we want to share this great news of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for 
writing history to be a beautiful story, the one to which every good story points. We thank you for revealing the radiance of your glory, your splendor, your beauty in Jesus. We thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of our hearts to behold the glory of Jesus. We thank you for giving the scriptures from beginning to end and in every part for the purpose of leading us to marvel at your glory in Jesus. And so we pray that you would help us to live lives of uh, wonder at Christ and that we wouldn't move beyond Jesus or get bored with your glory in Jesus, but we'd move deeper in and more in wonder. And we pray that you would use us to spread this marveling to others. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.